Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. This morning I'll be reading from Acts 18, 18 uh, down into chapter 19, verse 7. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. As we begin today, just a reminder quickly that chapter breaks are man-made from that perspective. And so there are times in our studies we kind of, we begin in one chapter and we slide into the next chapter, like today. It's kind of like we we're, we're, we're have a section here and a section here, but it's all one transitional section that's, that's happening here. And what I want to point out, because I think there's a common theme in this section, is why we're doing this together. Paul, um, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, is talking to Timothy. Um, Timothy, interestingly, is, it will be the pastor or the apostolic representative in, in Ephesus at that time. And so we're going to be seeing a little bit about Ephesus today, but even more next week we'll be um, seeing what happens in Ephesus. But Paul writes to Timothy, and he, and he gives him the definition of functional discipleship. And he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He said, In the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Timothy... I have discipled you. I have taught you these things. You now need to find other faithful men that you can teach in order that they can teach. Do you get it? That's the concept. Jesus, the Great Commission, told us to go and make disciples, not converts, disciples. Sadly, even if you would say, well, I think it was just converts. Are you doing that? We're not even doing that. I really think the primary problem with the church 
today is that we have neglected the great commission of our Lord, and that is to make disciples. We want numbers. We don't want depth. Depth causes people to leave because they don't want necessarily what all Jesus has to teach. So we want numbers. That, that makes us feel good in our culture today that you're a success if you have a lot of numbers. But Jesus didn't worry about that. Jesus, When Jesus died, think about it, he was a failure because there was only 120 people meeting in an upper room. Okay? But from the 120 people, we're still meeting here today, if you're tracking. Okay? So there's this concept of discipleship that is going to be borne out by Paul. Um, Paul's going to live it out in this section, okay? And we're going to see it demonstrated as we go. But it also is then this section of transition, okay? We have seen through this map, and it's getting a little bit more like, wow, there's all this stuff going on. But we saw in Paul's first missionary journey how he traveled from Antioch then into uh, the lower portions of Galatia in through Pamphylia and uh, Phrygia. He tried to go into the province of Asia, and he couldn't get there. Tried to go into the province of Bithynia, couldn't get there. So he went on into Mysia, and specifically to the city of Troas. There he saw a vision of, of a Macedonian saying, come over here. And so he they, they took that as their calling, so they went to Samothrace into Philippi. In Philippi, we, we, we followed them there, uh, where Paul and Silas are thrown into the jail. The Philippian jailer gets saved. Um, all these things happen, but there's just struggles that go on through the ministry as well. They go from there to Thessalonica, down to Berea, and then from Berea, they send him by boat down to Athens. When he's in Athens, then, he goes and he's, and he's speaking at the Areopagus, right, with the... Um, the the Stoics and the Epicureans. And then last week we saw that he goes to Corinth, which is only 40 miles away, and he spends 18 months in Corinth. Kind of a little bit of rest and recuperation moment. Today, so last week, so in that portion just last week, that was all 18 months, okay? But it was one city 18 months. Today, I don't know if you were listening um, well when Chuck was was reading, but here we go, okay? Today, this is what we're going to cover. You ready for this? He goes, to, first of all, from Corinth, down to Sincrea. Not a big jump down to Sincrea. But from Sincrea, he goes over to Ephesus. He finally gets into Ephesus. We'll talk about that next week. Okay? From Ephesus then, immediately, because he's going to keep the feast, he travels to Caesarea, and from Caesarea, he goes up to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, he's going to go, this, your Bible says he goes down to Antioch. Ready? Okay? So watch him go down to Antioch. It looks like what? It looks like he just went up. That's because you're thinking that way. So Jerusalem is higher, so he actually went down to Antioch. He went north, but he went down, okay? So remember a lot of times in the scriptures when you read some things, you know, like when you go, um, you go from Jerusalem, you go down to Jericho, but it's really north, you know, and from Jericho, you go up to Jerusalem. It's just, it's talking about elevation, not necessarily talking about north, south, and that kind of stuff, okay? So he goes to Antioch. From Antioch, then, he travels through the, 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 the churches that he's already been ministering to in Phrygia and in the southern portion of Galatia. And then from there, he could go one of two ways. I'm going to take the northern route because we're not necessarily told, but he goes back into Ephesus. I, I, I did that three times because I kept debating myself because we're not really told which way he goes. Did he, did he come back down through the mountains? Did he, you know, did he go to Perga and uh, Adelia and then come along the coast over that way? He could have done that. But we're not necessarily told that way, okay, which way. But I, I opted for this way because I think that was the original path that he chose, and I think he just chose his original path again. This time, he gets through the gate. Whatever, whatever was blocking him the first time through, do you remember that? You know, because he was, he was prevented by the Holy Spirit to get in there. This time, he's not prevented. So he gets, he gets in there this way. So it's kind of fun. So, the, so this all happens, and we're not told. I don't know how long this time, but that's got to be a pretty good long moment, right? Okay, so that's where we're at. So we're not told that time, that's not important, okay? And, and it's all being slammed together by Luke. So what's really important in what's going on here? I really think it's a matter of this concept of discipleship, this, this transition of ministry that begins to happen now. God used Paul to bring the gospel to the the Gentiles. But it wasn't just to the Gentiles. He began where? The synagogue. 
So he's bringing it to the Jews, but then it's opening up into the, to the Gentiles. And the whole goal is not that it's for me. So I joked yesterday, so like, um, David, you were at the, the, the graduation. So Tony, you were there as well, right? So the face of the, face of the, the graduation yesterday, the face of homes, the Homeschool Association is who right now? Jeff Gleason. Okay, which is really kind of fun. And so most people don't know this, but that was me for 20-something years. Okay, but it's fun for me now that no one even knows that. I mean, it's about four years ago I, I was doing it, but no one knows it now. I mean, I was at a board meeting, you know, and this one lady was exuding, this is a, a month ago, right, Brian? About how good of a job Jeff does and all this kind of stuff. And, and Brian turns around and says, you know, Bob's the one who actually he learned it from. And... <laughs> But I rejoice in the Lord for that because that's the goal. That's the goal of discipleship. Does that make sense? You want you pass it on, and you want somebody else to be that person. Okay, it's okay. It's a good thing. Okay, I'm still waiting for some, that person on the board. So, but just words out there, just kind of putting it out. So, anyways, but that's what's going to happen here in this transitional moment. Okay, and so we're going to see first of all the ministry of Paul, then the ministry of Aquila and Priscilla, and then we're going to see the ministry of this guy named Apollos, who we're going to be introduced to today. All this is going on, all this one moment. So I got a lot of information. We're going to slide through it. Maybe only two points we'll really talk about more in depth, but just kind of slide through this passage as we go and just see as a whole how God is using then these individuals to pass on the faith, okay? So first of all, Paul's ministry um, the first thing we see is to Aquila and Priscilla. Re this is kind of fun for me. Again, remember, when he goes into Corinth, these are the ones that he happenstanced to join up with. Why? They share the same trade. He's looking for a job. Circum it's just coincidental. He's looking for a job. This is the one, right? And so yesterday in the men's breakfast, as David alluded to earlier, we were talking about Psalm 139. And the, the, the one verse where it says about, um, it, it seems that God is saying that God was, that, that David's saying that God is acquainted with all of his ways. But really what it says in the Hebrew is that, that God is the one who had strewn or scattered his path in his lying down. That God was the one who, in his life, was the one who was determining his walkway, his trail, and where he was going to be hanging out for the night. Okay, So his going forth and his lying down, that God was the one who was scattering it. He was the one who was strewing his path. Well, that happens in life so many times. We see things just as well as just coincidental. But it wasn't coincidental. You don't know how God was working through you or somebody else to cause this event to happen the way it was. And so I think God wanted Paul to develop Aquila and Priscilla. God brought Paul to Corinth by himself without any money so that he had to get a job. Do you get it? And in getting a job, he has to hang out with Aquila and Priscilla. And poor Aquila and Priscilla, they got to hang out with Paul. Could you imagine? 18 months of hanging out with Paul. And it rubbed off. Now, apparently, they must have already loved the Lord. We saw that, right? And so they're open to his teaching. And so for those 18 months while he's working with them, he's discipling them. He's teaching them. He's instructing them. And they followed him. But when he leaves, they follow him. And they go with him to Sincrea and then to Ephesus. We'll talk about Sincrea in a moment. But then they go to Ephesus. What happens at Ephesus? He leaves them. He tells them to stay. Why? We're not told. But I'm going to read between the lines. Don't you like reading between the lines? <laughs> Say it again. They carry on the ministry there, okay? We'll see that in a moment when we come back to Aquila and Priscilla, okay? But to carry on the ministry, that's what they did. They were his apostolic representatives at that moment. Isn't that kind of cool? He discipled them for 18 months and then left them to do the gospel ministry in another city. Would we feel comfortable training somebody for 18 months? Now, I think that he had training how often with them? <laughs> Every day. Makes sense? A lot of time, okay? And so they were grown, okay, in that. Secondly, 
to those in the synagogue, because he comes to Ephesus, right? And he, when he comes into Ephesus, we're told again, the legomai, okay, the same word that we've been told, that he, um, he opened up the word to him, okay? It, wasn't, it doesn't really necessarily mean teach, but it means speak through, okay? And so, but he, he was doing that. He's taught through these things, okay, to them. And they, and they wanted him to stay. This is an amazing thing for me. This is not the same uh, rep, uh, what, uh, reputation, acceptance that he's had in other synagogues. Other synagogues, they want to what? They want to stone him. They want to kill him. That's going to come next week, okay? And so I don't know what happens in Ephesus in the meantime while he's gone, but that'll come next week. But here, they want him to stay. But Paul says, no, I can't because I've got to keep my vow to God. I've got to keep this. I've got to get to Jerusalem for this, this, this feast, okay? And so we have this presence of a vow that we're told about, that he um, cuts off his hair when he's in Sincrea, that he took this vow. So I want to talk just real briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's important for me right now. Um, not for me right now, but I think for us to talk about. And that is that there's even this vow that, that Paul took, because who is Paul? What, what do we know about Paul? Well, he was a Pharisee. He was a Levite. So you're, you're looking old man. Think new man. Who is he? That was Saul, Tarsus. Who's Paul? The apostle to the Gentiles. What major event happened in Acts 15 because of the ministry of Paul? The Council of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Council. And what came out of the Jerusalem Council? Who? Ah, the Gentiles. See, it was a determination of what the Gentiles needed to do. There was no statement regarding the what? Jews. Statements that were made during it, though, were by Peter as well, stating, look, you guys, you know that we as Jews can't even do all that's in the law. Why are you going to put that upon the Gentiles, right? But many times we come out of the Jerusalem Council and we say the law is made what? Void. And so, but you go to the writings of Paul, Paul never says that. Rather, the, the law has a purpose. And so in Galatians 5, we're told the purpose. Kids, we talked about that on Wednesday night, right? Remember it, Malachi? Ah, the law is a, what's your memory verse? The law is a what? Say it again. I can't hear you. No, nope, no, the law is not a bond servant. It is that because you probably learned that today. Okay, it is the picture of Haggai or Hagar. Okay, it's a tutor. Do you remember it's a tutor? And what was the what was the purpose of the law? To bring us. I heard it. To Christ. It's to bring us to Christ. That's the purpose of the law. The law had a purpose. The law wasn't evil. The law was good. Okay, and so. In fact, does anybody know what the new covenant is? What's the new covenant? You're part of it, yes? Jesus initiated it, yes? So what's the new covenant? You're no longer under the law. Yahweh says, I will write my law in your heart and upon your mind. So the law hasn't gone. It's now you don't have to. Now it's you want to. Do you understand? So first of all, we have this presence of vow. It's probably a Nazaritic vow. Um, we don't know that for a fact from everything. We're not told that. But the fact that he cuts off his hair probably is that concept, okay? And so he's in, he's in Corinth. He takes this vow. And when he leaves Corinth, when he gets to Sancria, is when he cuts off his hair. So uh, probably there's a, um, a tie back to what's going on in Corinth, okay? And so we're not sure why that is, okay? It could be um, a matter of being separated unto God. Remember what we talked about the city of Corinth? If you had to, de to, to describe Corinth uh, briefly, how would you describe it? Sin city. Sin city. Good, yeah. It was a very idolatrous city, okay? And an adulterous city as well at that, okay? And so it could be that he was um, doing this for... Uh, consecrated act, setting himself before 
before God as a, a remembrance that he'd taken a Nazaritic vow. A Nazaritic vow would be that he couldn't cut his hair, he wouldn't drink anything from the, the fruit of the vine, and he wouldn't touch a dead body. Okay, That was all part of the Nazaritic vow. And then at the end of it, you would cut off your hair and you would offer it as an offering to, to God at the temple. Hence, he's going to Jerusalem, right? So, um, so that could be, okay, it could be that. It could be seeking God's favor because he was in great fear. You remember what we read? That Jesus came to him and Jesus said what to him? Don't what? Don't fear. I've got many people in the city. So that all could have been stated as a result of Paul doing what? Taking the vow. Okay? So there's a lot of things we don't know that's in it, but what we do know is that Paul, the preacher of grace, took a vow that was part of the what? Part of the law. So I want to encourage you in that, okay? You know, there are a lot of ultra-dispensationalists. I'm a strong dispensationalist from that perspective, okay? I see Israel as separate from the church, the church separate from Israel, okay? I am what a Jew ought to be today, I'm a follower of the Jewish Messiah, okay? But I'm not Israel, if that makes sense, okay? God's still going to deal with Israel. However, that doesn't mean that the law is evil and the law is bad. The law is good, okay? And there are things that, are, that God uses that sometimes are good. So the fasting thing. People look at us sometimes when I talk about us fasting because a lot of people look at it like, oh, it's an Old Testament thing. Well, no, actually, it's in the New Testament as well. And fasting is a very important thing. So vows before God okay, are not to be taken lightly, okay? And that's what we're going to see here, and that is the precedent then of the vow. The priority of his completion, the vow took priority over ministry. People asked him to stay, to teach him the word. And Paul said what? No, I can't, because I made a vow, and I need to get to Jerusalem. My vow to God is more important than ministry to people. How does that make you feel? But it's a true statement. I've lived that. I get that. It doesn't always go pleasantly. When you give your word to God, do what you have vowed and trust God with the results and consequences. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether you're foolhardy in opening up your mouth and giving the vow. Been there, done that. That's why my kids get frustrated sometimes, because I don't want to say, I'm going to do that. Maybe, can we, Dad, can we do, maybe. I don't know how the day's going to play out. I don't know how the week's going to play out. When we get closer to that point, maybe so. I hope so. But I'm not going to tell you we're going to do it, because if I tell you we're going to do it, I gave you my, my word. I've learned that in life. Maybe I, I'm too far the other way on that, okay? But I tried... I don't want to promise something if I don't feel like I can do it. In the days of the home improvement business, I lost money on jobs because I gave my, my word. And I wasn't going to charge you, the customer, because I blew it. That's on me. I gave my word. I said, this is what I'll do it for. If I'd have known better, I'd have worked it out a little different way, you know, but I didn't. So why should you pay the consequence? of my giving my word and not being able to stick to my word. Does it make sense? You stick to your word. You're doing your word is important, okay? The particulars of its completion, the hair, and then you see I got a sacrifice, question marks. So I don't know if you go there, but if you read Numbers chapter 6 and you can go there and look at the, the, the things for the Levitical sacrifice, there's um, Levitical, I'm sorry, Levitical sacrifice, the Nazaritic vow, there is at the end of it, not only cutting off the hair and offering it, but there's also offering of sacrifices. And he's going to the temple. And the temple's still in existence, and they still give have what? Sacrifices at that point. And so I'm not told. Isn't there places in Scripture you just love there to be another verse or two to give me more information? And we're not told. We're not even told how long he was in Jerusalem. All we're told is that he went up, met the brethren, and left again. That's all we're told about. But we know that he also went up to do what? To satisfy his vow. So I just want to challenge you in this one, okay? Um, that if you're there, and, 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 and this is causing you to, to struggle a little bit, that's a good thing, okay? Pray about it. Think about it, okay? 
Um, don't try to put everybody in your box all the time on things, okay? But, but here's, here's Paul, and he's doing the Jewish thing, but he's still a what? He's still apostle to the Gentiles, but he's still doing the Jewish thing, and it's okay, okay? All right, to the believers of Antioch, Phrygia, and Galatia, again, very quickly coming through, okay? But we're, we're just giving a message that he went through all those churches, and we're simply told that he strengthened them, encouraged them, he gave them a greater foundation. It's really he's building into them. Is really the word what the word there is talking about that he just he built upon what was already there, just encouraging them. Okay, so he w- went through. We're not told how long. I don't think he probably was there very long. I think he probably spent a Sunday or a Sunday, a Saturday. Year, you know, as they, as they're meeting, right? And he just comes through and he encourages them in the faith again because he's got an agenda. He's getting back to Ephesus. Okay, but then he runs into these. New converts who happen to be disciples of John, right? We find that out. But I don't, again, know. There's a lot of things I'd like to be expounded for me in the scriptures. This is one of the passages, okay? How did, how did Paul initially start talking to them? Because it sounds to me like he started asking them the question of what? What's it, what's it sound like, the first question he asks them is? Say it again. What about it? Give me the question. Do you have the Holy Spirit? I mean, when's the last time you went out witnessing? And that was your question to the people. So do you have the Holy Spirit? We want to know, do they have Jesus? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? But apparently he didn't ask that first. He asked about the Holy Spirit because they come back in their ignorance and they say what? We don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. Now. I'm reading between the lines again, okay? If they were Jewish, they would know there was a Holy Spirit. That's Old Testament. It's the Ruach of, of, of Elohim. The, 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 the Spirit of God was all throughout the Old Testament. They would understand the concept of the Holy Spirit, right? These guys don't even understand the concept of the Holy Spirit. We don't even know that there is such a thing. What is this thing that called the Holy Spirit, okay? So, so I don't know whether they're Gentiles or whether they're just ignorant um, <clears throat> Jews. Okay, but they have this ignorance. They have no knowledge. Okay, so the word ignorance doesn't isn't really a rude term. It just really means that they don't have any knowledge. It's like the, we use the word agnostic. Okay, so what does Paul do? He teaches them. He takes this opportunity to begin teaching. Don't you wonder where they met? Are they just in the marketplace? Are they in the street? Did they go into a tavern and say, hey, let's sit down and have a, have a Coke and let's talk about this? You know, how do they, how do they do this thing? You know, all of a they, he just meets these guys and he starts teaching them. Did they, have they heard about him? And then when they found out about him, they're accepting his, his teaching. There's a lot of questions I have going through this thing. I mean, he just meets these 12 random guys and he starts teaching them. And as he's teaching them, what happens? Well, they don't necessarily receive the Holy Spirit at that moment. We'll, we'll, we'll come to there because it's going to happen, right? Say, so Steve. Well, not yet. That's after they receive the Holy Spirit. So, in between, said they have to be baptized. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going one step even between that. They believe him. I mean, this is a huge deal. Think about it. It's some random guy you met. Yeah, and he's going to ask you, have you received the Holy Spirit? I don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. And so this guy, random guy that you've just met now, if you didn't know who Paul was, starts telling you about all these things. And you what? And you believe it. I mean, Paul tells us there's a whole lot of whole false that are out there too, right? And false workers of the devil that are out there trying to, to deceive people. How do they know it's not one of them there? These are just a lot of things. I mean, I sit there and go, this is kind of cool. I mean, I would love to be there. I'd love to be in their brain at this moment. What are they hearing? What are they saying? How is the Holy Spirit ministering at this moment? Because it's God who draws. Does that make sense? So they already are in tuned, if you would, to God, because they've been baptized into the baptism of John. So apparently they heard about John's baptism, and they, they joined into that, right? Now, what was one of the things that John very distinctly taught in his teachings? Say again. 
Repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. And yes, keep going, Kathy. No, you're good with it. Because I'm not worthy to what? Untie the sandal, the one who's what? Coming after me. He who's coming after me was preferred before me because he was before me. Do you understand? So he was preparing the way for Messiah. Jesus agreed, but Messiah, right? So these guys probably know that. And so Paul now is what? Filling. Yeah, he's telling them about Messiah. He's filling in the details. And these guys never saw Jesus. Never heard of Jesus to this moment. Isn't this kind of cool? But they hear about him. Not just wonder, they receive. They receive the message. This is a powerful moment. Again, this is the working of God. They receive the message, and proof that they receive the message then is they're immersed into the name of Jesus. And as they're immersed into the name of Jesus, that's when they're immersed also in, with the Holy Spirit, right? And, and so when they're immersed in the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak in tongues. Well, tongues and prophesy. Go ahead. These men were already prepared. Yes. So, so, so it wasn't a happenstance. I'm saying this for the tape. So it wasn't a happenstance. It was a long process. Yes, but it still was, if you would, at this moment for each of them, a happenstance. We can go back and we can look over the history. So you can go back, and I challenge you. We talked about this a little bit yesterday in the, in the men's breakfast that I've done this. I mean, the Lord can, I'm overwhelmed. Such, one, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. To, to think back on how God has been working in my life, strewing my path, and preparing me to bring me to a certain place. In that moment that was happening, I didn't realize it was happening. But now I can look back and see it. Does it make sense? So Paul and these 12 have a happenstance. But from God's point of view, it's, it's the fruition of other things that he's been doing in their lives. And he just happens to have Paul. You remember that, that, that whole little thing of where Paul's gone, right? So think about everywhere Paul's gone and that whole thing. And it just happens to be that Paul happens to be in the moment at the time. With all those places that Paul just was, he just happens to be in the right place at the right time. Do you think God can use you at the right place at the right time? Or do you think you're always the wrong person at the wrong place in the wrong time? We, we think about ourselves that way. Who am I? Say again? Yeah. yeah. And, but God is the one who does the work, right? He's the one who works behind us. So Paul is nothing. And Paul would tell you that. Paul nothing. But he's a vessel that God is using. And so they speak in tongues. I don't want to hide from it. And we talked about this when we were back in Acts 2. Okay? This is an outlier for me. I, because there's no other context given to me in this one of what happens. Acts chapter 10, I'm told that it's the same, same thing happened. Peter says it's the same thing that happened to at, as it happened to us in, in chapter 2, or at Pentecost, right? Okay, So we can go back and we can see those things. Here we don't have any outliers, and so I'm not going to tell you anything on it. I'm, 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 but I'm not hiding from it. Make sense? I don't see proof here that, this is, um, that tongues is necessary for salvation. Do you understand? Again, I see it as a sign that it proves that, that the gospel was spreading into that region. Okay? But it's an outlier, and I'm just going to be straight with you on it, okay? It's one of those passages that I continually pray over it and study it and meditate on it and that kind of stuff because it doesn't necessarily fit in any of the, the patterns that I want, you know, not that I want to, but that I see, okay? I don't see it as in Corinthians 12 to 14. And Paul's not saying, give me any data to, to, to prove that it's like at Pentecost. Does that make sense? And so I think it's, it's important for us, if we want to be true to the word, to acknowledge that, is all I'm saying, okay? I'm not hiding from it. 
part of me wants to just, shh, you slide right past this passage, you don't even worry about it, and you keep moving on, because we've already talked about tongues. Well, you go back and listen to those messages. But I want to be honest, okay? So, but they prophesy. So all this is going on in order to prove, though, that what? The legitimacy of, what's, of their salvation. That's exactly right. That's, that's, to me, the key, okay, of what's happening right here, okay? So that's Paul. Now we slide into Aquila and Priscilla, okay? So back at the beginning of the passage again, and we come back through again. So what do we know about Priscilla and Aquila? Well, first of all, they began ministering at the synagogue um, when they were left there, okay? That's where Paul left them. Paul left them to minister, and we're told that they continue to do that. Well, how do we know that? Okay, how do we know that that's there? Well, go to verse 26. Okay, and so in verse 26, we read, So he, that is Apollos, began to speak boldly in where? It's the synagogue. Okay, so this is Apollos, right? But then the next statement is, When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So, therefore, Aquila and Priscilla had to hear him where? In the synagogue. You get what I'm saying? So they didn't immediately not go to synagogue. They did exactly what Paul had done, and they ministered through synagogue, okay? And so it was while they were there then that they ministered to Apollos, okay? And so when they, they, they're there and Apollos comes, Apollos is speaking boldly, they understand that Apollos is, is weak on a theology, okay? He doesn't have the fullness of information, which is really kind of fun for me, again, because they were only instructed by Paul for 18 months. And here they are in the, in the synagogue in Ephesus, and Apollos comes in, and we'll talk about Apollos in a moment, okay? But he's very eloquent and all this kind of stuff, and he's speaking boldly. But they have the boldness to know that they 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 know, that they know right? That this guy's coming in, and everyone's, ooh, and wow, and over this guy, you know? But they know that he's locking. And so they go up to him. Who are they? Who, how, how are we first introduced to them? They're tent makers. Do you get it, y'all? They're just tent makers. They're not rabbis. They're not the synagogue rulers. They didn't go to seminary. They never went to Bible college. Well, they had Paul. They had a professor with them for 18 months, right? But it wasn't called that. It was just called discipleship. That's what they had. They knew the Word of God well enough that they understood the guy was lacking in his theology, in his doctrine. But well, as we'll see in him in a moment, they also saw something in him that knew that they could what? Teach him. This is so beautiful. As we start off with this verse, the ones whom Paul has soaked his life into are now turning around and doing what? Soaking their life into somebody else. And that which they had received from Paul, among many witnesses, quote-unquote, if you would, they are now turning around and giving it to a faithful man who will be able to what? Teach it and do the same. That's exactly right. And then we're told, the body of believers. Now, I, I go to 1 Corinthians 16 here because Paul is writing at this moment to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16. Um, but he's writing to the church of Corinth from Ephesus, okay, um, from, from Asia. And so you see the churches of Asia, and if you remember, Asia is not the continent, it's the, the province of Asia, okay, which is where Ephesus was. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with a church that is in their house. And so as the church grew, and as they were kicked out of the, the synagogue, Aquila and Priscilla opened up their house and said, you all just meet here. And probably became very instrumental as teachers in that church. Again, I want to challenge you all. 
please just not see yourself as just a tent maker. I'm just a tent maker. We elevate tent makers now. Tent maker ministry, all this kind of stuff. No, you get it? They weren't special people. They were just seamstresses. They were just making clothes, making tents. So I don't care what you do in life. Ministry is a lifestyle choice. Ministry is a lifestyle choice. We can, we, can, we can say, Paul, well, Paul, you know, he was a Pharisee. He was this, he was that. But Paul chose ministry as a lifestyle. He did it wherever he went. But now we're seeing that played out in his disciples. Kathy? They did. That's exactly right. That's right. That's right. That's right. 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 So, so tent tent makers would minister to multiple nationalities and for an extended period of time. Yeah, all over the world. That's right. And so, so God knows how that plays out. And again, you are where you are in life because God has you there. I just want you to struggle with that one. Think about that for a moment. And God wants to use you where you are. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm from the city, and I got city ease all over me. I know it. I'm a northerner. Isn't that even worse? But you've been sitting with me for 30 years. Go figure that one. So, yeah, I'm trying to save me. That's good. <laughs> I'll eat grits every once in a while. I use them for my bricks, too. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> anyways, but I know. I mean, and, and I wanted to be a metallurgical engineer. But that, that door closed to me. I wasn't even a believer then. That door closed. And I got pushed toward computer science. And I use it all the time in ministry. In ministry. Do you get it? I mean, I could go on and on and on. God has you where you're at, not for your own benefit. Show others Christ. Kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what it's all about all the time. Ministry is a lifestyle. Priscilla and Aquila, they got it. And they start living it out. Well, they affected then the life of Apollos. Who's Apollos? We're told that he's a Jew from Alexandria. Okay. Now, if you have the sermon note sheet from the, the one that was sent out, you don't have this point. Okay. So if you grabbed the one when you came in, you got this. But if you printed it out from the, the email, you haven't got this point. So, because I, I said, ah, man, I got to include it. Um, because it's, it's a big deal. A Jew from Alexandria was, was, was very special, okay? Uh, so this is, comes from, again, um, against Appian by Josephus, where he is talking about the Jewish race again and how important uh, the Jewish people were. And he's talking about down in Egypt, um, the city of Alexandria, which was named after Alexander, okay, the great. And so um, the finest residential quarter, okay, um, was given to the Jews. It was, and he says, he says, if the Jews owed their occupation and subsequent undisturbed tenure of this quarter to force of arms, in other words, they fought for it, well, that would just prove their valor. That's not what I'm trying to prove. He says, but if they did it, if you want to say, well, that's because they just fought for it, well, that means that they fought your Grecian people and beat you. And so that by itself would be like, ha uh-huh, you know? He said, but that's not where I'm going. He said, but rather, it was presented to them as a residence by Alexander himself, and they obtained privileges on par with those of the Macedonians who were the Greeks. Okay? And so he was basically saying that Alexander exalted the, the Jewish people to such a place that he put them on par level, which is a, a phenomenal statement. I don't have time to get into this, but if you go over to the, how Alexander came and conquered the, um, the world, and you see that he comes down the coast of Tyre, <clears throat> and he goes down into... Egypt, and he comes back up, he never touches Jerusalem. 
never touches Jerusalem. It's really kind of a fun thing, which substantiates this back and forth. Does it make sense? So to be a Jew from Alexandria was a special statement. It's like Paul being from Tarsus, where he then, we'll see this later on in Acts, where he says that he's a what? He's a Roman citizen. Okay? So in the Greek world, to be a Jew from Alexandria, you have a special privilege as well. Okay? Now, the next thing we're told about him as well is that he is uh, eloquent of speech. Literally, he's an orator. He's a speaker. Okay? That's what he does. Paul stated that he was not an orator. Paul said he wasn't eloquent of speech. But Apollos, on the other hand, we're told, is eloquent of speech. Okay? He's able to pontificate in a way that the point comes across. Okay? I'm not that. I know I'm a teacher from that perspective, and you guys sit here, and I don't mean to, to put you down by saying I'm not good at it. Okay? I don't mean that. But I know from my perspective, I, I listen to some others sometimes, and I think, wow, I wish I could teach like that. Wow, I wish I could speak like that. I wish I could concisely state what they've just concisely stated. But I feel like I go around the barn a hundred times to finally find the door. Okay? And so there are individuals who God has equipped to speak. They have that ability. Apparently, Paulus was one of these guys. Okay? That he has this ability. In, in doing that then, he was also mighty in dunotas. He was mighty. He was able he had abilities in the scriptures okay so he wasn't just a good speaker but when he spoke he was able to do what bring in the scriptures okay and so he was good from that perspective his fervency literally the word there means that he was he was glowing he was glowing he was hot he was on fire for God, such that everybody around him, what? Knew it. So stop for a moment and ask yourself, would that describe you? Not whether you're a good orator. You know, you could say, oh, I'm slow of speech like Moses, right? I'm slow of speech, slow of tongue, you know. But are you on fire for God? To the point that everybody around you knows it. Or would it be shocking for them? to find out that you actually were a believer. It's been a challenge for me from that perspective. I want to be on fire for the Lord all the time. I don't want to be cloaked. I don't want to be camouflaged. But it's so easy to try to hide it at times so that you're not embarrassed. That's sad. I mean, you're embarrassed. But if we're honest, that's how it plays out. We don't want to become embarrassed. We don't want people to look bad down on us. We don't want people to think something awful of us. That's a wrong understanding. He was on fire for the Lord. Everybody knew it. He was willing to receive instruction from Aquila and Priscilla. His teachableness. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it gives the um, qualifications for a bishop or an overseer. One of them, it says in our Englishes that he's able to teach. I want to challenge you in the Greek. What it really says is that he's teachable. He's teachable. If you are going to be an individual who is able to teach others, you better yourself be able to be taught. Otherwise, it's arrogance. You want to be able to teach that which is true. Be not many teachers, masters, James 3, 1, for such have the greater condemnation. So he was teachable, humble. He was willing to receive instructions from two people. Rodney and Michelle, at the end of this, take me aside. They say, Bob, I appreciate that but you were really off on this one point. Well, who are you? You old retiring warrant officer. How long did you go to seminary? No, I wouldn't say that to him. But think about it. Our pride part kicks in on something like that, doesn't it? Always, yeah. But that, 
It can't be where I'm at. The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes, you have ordained praise. God's going to speak through whoever he wants to speak. And I need to be willing, humbly, to listen and to receive. Doesn't mean that everybody's got to be right and I got to always be wrong. No. But I better be willing to what? Listen. Because they may very well be right and I'm very well wrong. Okay? He was teachable. Um, his def- there we go. His desire. And so from there he leaves and he goes to the Akiya over to where Corinth is. Okay? And so over into the region of Akiya because he has a desire to be able to teach the people there, to build them up. Again, ministry as a lifestyle. This is just part of who he is. He has this burning desire to build people up. I asked you last week, and same question, what is your burning desire in life? What is your, what, in the end, when you, got, when you die and you stand before God, what is it going to be that you want to be able to say, yes, God, this is it. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to realize that my life was just a, a vessel poured out on his behalf. Say again? When we get there, that's right. But it happens while you're living here. It doesn't just happen when you get there. It happens now. You have to make decisions now. Sadly, we get... You get what I'm talking about. Many people have what? Regrets. If they wish they could do it all over again. Well, don't do that way. Live it right now. No regrets later. <clears throat> and then finally, his defense. Because he goes and he vigorously refutes the Jews. I love this. Because again, I don't know what they learned from Aquila and Priscilla. Okay? But he listened to them. And so now the wisdom of Paul, which was given to Aquila and Priscilla, is now being bestowed upon Apollos. And Apollos goes out, and he begins to refute the Jews. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, when he's talking about the division that's in their church, Paul talks about himself. He talks about Cephas, which is the Hebrew name for Peter. And he talks about one other individual. Do you know who it is? Apollos. Apollos. And the idea there is that he knows that Apollos isn't a competition, that they're all working on the same team, but that the people have made it what? I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas. And then then the fourth group says, well, I'm of Jesus. (laughs) I'm not of them, I'm I'm of Jesus. And so that we've got to be careful Because God wants there to be a unity of work. And so Apollos goes out, and he begins to proclaim the truth again. So in the end, same question as last week, what is your goal in life? Is it kingdom-oriented? What's your goal in life? In the end of your days, is it going to be that you had ministry as a lifestyle? Or is it going to be that you had self-centeredness as a lifestyle? Is your life God-focused or self-focused? Are you desiring to be in a discipleship relationship? Being discipled and discipling others. And so I didn't really talk about that a lot, but that's what discipleship was, right? So the things that you've heard from me passed down to others. And so there's in that discipleship part, there's two sides of it. I'm So I'll pick on Rodney again since you're sitting up front. You know, so I, I go to disciple Rodney, but the reality is, and if you've never met with me, I tell you this, This isn't just me discipling you, it's us discipling each other. I may equip you in knowledge that I have, but the reality is God's going to use you to challenge me as well. And so it's got to be able to go both ways, okay? Are you using the abilities and gifts that God has given you to minister to and for him? How faithful are you to perform that which you have stated you would do? That's going back to your, your vow, your word. And then finally, is there a need to change the way you think? and therefore change the way you act. Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of how you used Paul and then Aquila and Priscilla and then Apollos, and you transferred your word, your truth, 
to each one of these people that they would be able to use it for your ministry, for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work that in our lives, Lord, not just in mine, but every individual that's here. Lord, that we would take those things that you have given to us and that we would be faithful to distribute them to others that we come in contact with. Lord, I pray that you would help me to be faithful, that even in the testimonies, that from the testimony time, Lord, that to be faithful in the moment um, to be able to witness um, to individuals that they, as they come into my path and uh, not to be self-centered in my time, but Lord, that I would see the, the, the circumstances as being divinely directed, that I would be able to open my mouth boldly and to share what you want me to share, um, knowing that you have divinely appointed that individual to be with me at that moment as well. So, Lord, help me um, to be faithful. Help me not to shirk my duty. Um, not because I have to, but because I want to. Be glorified in this assembly. In Christ's name, amen.